Thank you very much, Jody. Uh, and as Jody introduced me, my name is Scott Stewart, and I am very pleased to be here presenting my research into the existential experience of clergy and chaplain in the care of those with dementia. Now, we have a whole lot of ground to cover in the next 25 to 30 minutes. This presentation started off being an hour and a half long, and I've cut it down to 25 to 30 minutes. So let's just jump right into it, okay? So, if we're looking at a clinical definition of dementia, just what is dementia? Well, dementia is defined as an impairment in short and long-term memory, as well as an inability to learn new information and an inability to remember past personal information or facts of common knowledge. Dementia also attacks an individual's self-sufficiency, ability to reason, remember, process new information, and cognition. As cognition is the foundation for most of our human activity within our modern Western culture, dementia also becomes an attack on the very personhood of the individual threatening relationship itself. Now, as we look at dementia within Canadian society, the stats, they paint a fairly stark picture for us. Within Canada at present time, over a half a million Canadians have Alzheimer's or related dementia and in this year alone, another 103,000 Canadians will develop some form of dementia. Now, following these trends, if nothing changes by the year 2036 in Canada, there will be 1.1 million Canadians living with dementia. Now, these numbers are staggering, considering that the direct medical costs in Canada right now stand at around $8 billion a year and are estimated to jump to $92 billion by the year 2038. Just from the stats alone, we can see that dementia is quickly becoming a crisis in our society. And let's be brutally honest here, it's a crisis that at $92 billion, our healthcare system just can't manage. So as we look at the evolution of care and how we as a society have provided that care, there has been a direct correlation between the method of care the cost on the medical system, the quality of life for the individual, and the stress on the family unit. For example, an intervention that is quickly becoming obsolete within the area of dementia care is called the objective reality check. Now this is a process of attempting to bring the patient or loved one back into reality as we know it. But as the individual with dementia continues to cognitively decline, and memory lapses, gaps, and rewrites become more pronounced, this process holds the potential to actually obscure communication, thereby increasing attention-getting behaviors in the patient, while also putting further strain on an already exhausted medical and family unit. The method of our care then has a very real effect on our healthcare system, on our family units, and on society in general. Now this is also why the experience of the individual caregiver in this research, chaplain and clergy, is so important. They open for us doors into the reality of those with dementia and the knowledge that that reality may be different one person to the next. The question, what is the experience of chaplain and clergy in the care of dementia, takes us into a natural, organic direction moving us into the subjective reality that is dementia care. Now at this point, I'd like to simply introduce my two primary theological lenses. These are process theology and Celtic theology. Now the first, process theology, simply stated, is a theology of relationship. God relates to us, in process with us, in time, changing with us, rather than distantly outside of creation and relationship. God has knowledge of every possible potential, but the ability to choose within those potentials belongs to the individual making the choice. Within process theology, and this is the crux for our conversation in dementia and dementia care, God is incarnate in the lives of all human beings, offering us whatever good is achievable for us from one moment to the next. My second theological lens is Celtic theology, as described by modern theologians such as John O'Donohue and Philip J. Newell. Now under this theological view, when God created, God didn't create out of nothings. God created out of God's self. 
Now that means that everything that has being has God woven into the very fabric of its existence. Because of this, there's an emphasis placed on listening for the rhythm of God, for the heartbeat of God within creation and within other people. In terms of dementia care, this theological lens holds some fairly powerful implications in terms of the inherited worth of the individual and potential for communication in the rhythms of dementia itself. Now, to quickly mention my methodology, I used a process of hermeneutic phenomenology looking at the lived experience of my participants. There were four participants, equally divided among chaplain and clergy, and each participant was asked the same ten questions that deviated only in flow of conversation. Now, in terms of themes coming from my research, what I found really interesting was that no matter how I looked at the data, one theme continued to present itself while being defined by three sub-themes. So what we have here on this slide is my attempt to capture that graphically. We see at the center the primary theme, that of relationship, and defining that theme of relationship are the themes of community, connection, and theodicy. In terms of dementia care, my research has shown that the ministry is all about relationship. It's all about fostering relationship through developing and maintaining a mutual connection with people, and through that connection, allowing the person with dementia to enter into some form of community. As we encounter the theme of theodicy and reflect on that theologically, what we find is that, like the themes of connection and community, it forces us to reconsider and reimagine our concept of relationship in the face of dementia. Therefore, the goal for the remainder of this presentation will be to explore these three themes in an effort to define and explore the central theme of relationship. And in the words of one of my participants, relationship, 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 it is all about relationship. So let's start to explore that by looking at our first theme that of connection. So to begin, for my participants, this sense of connection begins with people long before they even meet them and is rooted in their own theology of ministry. Now, although each participant had a very different theology of ministry, this sense of connection with people begins by affirming the essential worth of an individual regardless of whether or not they are entrenched in dementia regardless of whether or not they are a productive, communicative member of society. This sense of worth is so primary that it continued to present throughout my interviews. One participant, after a discussion of what he felt was unhelpful in caring for those with dementia, commented that, sometimes when society, professors or religion see that they're not worthy, a lack of worth, I find that really discomforting because even people who are at the end of their life, I believe that they're worth something. I believe a child is worth something. I believe a drug addict is worth something. I believe a scientist is worth something even if they talk in realms beyond our comprehension. And I see an Alzheimer's patient the same way. They are worth something. They are a child of God. And deep within them, they are a wonderful reflection of an imaginative creator. Another participant, after noting the differences between a Western model of aging versus an indigenous model of aging, commented that, a big reason I was compelled again was as an advocate for them, that they are still of value in our lives. And then I should say that the other model of aging that I think is much more healthy is the one advocated by the indigenous populations, which is seeing life as a circle. In that sense, all of life is of equal value, so childhood is as valuable as a time when we might have dementia. Another indication of the inherent worth that continued to surface in my research time and time again was in the form of viewing individuals with dementia as a kind of teaching elder. As one participant put it, so rather than view them as sidelined or kind of useless or not valuable, I view them as wise people. Another commented that, I realize they are teaching me the lessons that no one of my age can teach me, and the absolute wisdom that we encounter in these people allows us to grow ourselves. 
and still another. They are just precious people. They give back to me more than I can possibly give back to them. So before they even meet, there's a sense of connection embedded in this idea of worth. There is also a kind of mutuality to the relationship with a caregiver as they encounter someone with dementia, takes something with them as the result of that care. In other words, there's something below the level of cognition here that's being communicated. And that brings us into the second aspect of connection, communication. In terms of communication, each participant within this study, through direct comment or through anecdotal evidence, indicated that there exists a level of communication that is not grounded in cognition. This communication is steeped in emotion and feeling, metaphor and rhythm, and within our modern Western culture, we may have problems visualizing or understanding that type of communication because we are so dependent on cognition. And think about that for a moment. Think about all the activities within your daily life that require some kind of cognitive response. I mean, when we really think about it, we can't even go to the grocery store and buy food for ourselves without some level of cognition. One of my participants went as far as to claim that we in Western society value cognition more than anything else. And in a sense, I think she's right. However, for people whose cognitive areas of the brain have been literally destroyed by dementia, there still remains a basic human need for relationship and for connection, both social connection and spiritual connection. There are still basic desires that need to be met, desires of validation and the ability to make meaning out of one's life. After all, human beings cannot tolerate meaninglessness. And as hope is a byproduct of meaning, without which no one can live and without which difficult situations are made worse, this need to connect and enter into relationship has to be met. Needing to connect and enter into some kind of relationship is echoed throughout my research. For example, one participant commented that, they are so glad to see you. And maybe that's because they can't remember being with people and they're hungry for it. And I respond, would you say they're hungry for relationship? And the answer, relationship or human contact or meaning, there's something about meaning there. And another participant, they still have feelings even if they can't express them that well. And yet another participant, there is a certain thing, there is a certain, I think, depth of God in that person that is longing to connect back into the larger sense of God and by being there, you allow them that divine spark to bring them back to rejoice with eternity. The desire and the need to connect and to enter into social and spiritual relationship is present, but there's a problem. How do people with dementia fill that desire, find meaning, and feel hope in a cognitively based world when their cognitive functionality is so badly damaged? Well, some answers to that very complex question presented in my interviews in a variety of ways, both theoretical and theological. One participant went into great detail around this topic, while the others touched on it anecdotally. In the first case, she sees that what's not helpful is to go in there and expect them to get into your reality to expect them to use your level of cognition. We need to enter their reality. And another participant, they communicate, but mostly through metaphor. So even when you're commuting, communicating through touch, those touches can be quite metaphoric, one thing representing another. Things that we might not catch with our cognitive minds, they see with different eyes. In other words, as the cognitive areas of the brain are destroyed, other areas take over. The human need for connection is still present, and that desire reaches out in whatever ways the individual can, largely through metaphor, touch, and repetition. These individuals begin to speak another language of sorts, a language not grounded in cognition, 
a language of dementia that is reaching out for connection and for relationship in whatever ways they can. What my participants also made very clear during my interviews is that they had a sense of God within that connection. They described an almost trifold relationship between the caregiver, the care receiver, and God. And so now let's take a look at that relationship. For one participant, when a dementia patient begins to enter into a repetitive activity, such as rubbing a table over and over again, or asking the same question over and over again, she sees in the words a rhythm there that helps me not to be frustrated with it, but rather I think it's a rhythm, and perhaps through that rhythm we can communicate again. When I asked her about that rhythm and whether or not she felt God there, this participant responded by saying, yeah, I haven't thought of it that deeply, except that I felt God's presence more there in that rhythm. She continued by commenting that God is present in the tender, wounded parts of these individuals' lives, just as Jesus was present on the fringes of society with the most unlikely of people. God is then present in the unlikely rhythms of a dementia patient. And as this participant joined in the rhythm of her patients, she saw through them a type of unconditional love. She goes on. This giving of all of themselves is more easily accessible, and I feel God in that. I experience the divine in them through unconditional love. Things are simpler, stripped down. For this participant, then, God is felt as being incarnate in the other through the rhythms of that dementia language that we mentioned earlier. This is a very Celtic understanding of God in relationship with humankind as we together listen for and encounter God in the rhythms of the other. Another participant in this study saw that in the moment of his care, God is there, they are there, you are there, all is good. He went on to say there is a certain depth of God in that person that is longing to connect back into the larger sense of God. For that one moment God is in that person, God is in you, God is in the space between the two of you. For this participant then, God is a present active force in the rhythm of that care while also being incarnate in both the care receiver and the caregiver. Again, this is a view steeped in a Celtic theology of listening and experiencing God in the other and within ourselves. Another participant who comes from a self-identified process theological perspective sees that we all have the divine spark within us. So that's part of everything I do when I companion someone with dementia. I just try to open myself to the spirit in this place and I spend five or ten minutes Meditation isn't the right word, but I try to open myself to the Spirit, and I try to include the person that is with me in this place, and I felt lots of godness in that time and place. For this participant, there is a continual process of creation as she opens herself into a space where the Spirit is the active force, offering potentials, and the dementia care becomes an expression of that continual process of creation. In bringing these experiences together, what remains is that God is present in the midst of that care. God is experienced as being an active participant in this care, along with both the care receiver and the caregiver. The result of that participation is experienced differently as the incarnate God, as a rhythm, as a continual act of creation. But regardless, God is part of that care in this trifold relationship, revealing God's self to us in the thin and unexpected spaces of people with dementia. Now also connected into that primary theme of relationship is community. And what I found quite interesting throughout the course of my research is that community wasn't actually a focus for me. And in fact, I had no question around the community or the community's role within dementia care. However, as the interviews progressed, three out of four of my participants, without any prompting from me at all, made direct comment on the community and the community's role within dementia care. 
So perhaps the best way to get at that data is to simply read some of those quotations and then enter into a type of analysis together. One participant began by recalling a song entitled Emily Remembers by Shirley Eckhart. It's a song that brings into focus the process of dementia care and all of the things we lose as that process continues. But then it shifts into the idea of remembering and remembering for other people. The message of that song is that I'll remember for you. And my participant reflecting on that message commented that I'll remember them for you. So what's not helpful, I think, is to think that this is an individual disease. This is a community disease. And if we think it's just about them, we've missed it. It's about us. And we remember for them the things they can't remember. If they can't remember they've loved us, we remember for them that they used to. So we can't see this as an individual disease. I'll remember them for you, and that brings us closer. It's all about relationship. It's all about relationship. It's all about the body of Christ. If you can't, we will remember for you. Another participant, after discussing how his faith had been informed by the care he offers, stated that, I guess my faith has been informed in that, even if I can't, the community can. And yeah, there's a lot of hope in that. And it's not an irrational hope, it's very much a Christian hope. And so, and so it is, I think, with dementia. Even when I can't, the community can, and they shall come in such a way that will connect me. So what I think we're seeing here, and that some of my participants named for us, is that the community is, in fact, the body of Christ as described by Paul for individuals with dementia. The community and the caregiver as part of that body moves out, journeys with an individual with dementia, and connects them into a larger sense of community, even if that connection is only experienced within that one single moment of care. For my participants, these people are valuable members of the body and are no more or less important than any other member. And in order to foster relationship the body, the community needs to reach out to those with dementia. What also became apparent in my research was the need for that community to reach out to the adult children and the family members of the individual with dementia. Throughout my interviews, there was an emphasis in each participant to provide care and to bring families into a larger sense of community to again foster relationship, although a different kind of relationship with the adult children and family members. Now in my research, the idea of suffering continued to present itself. Suffering in the absence of relationship, in the absence of meaning and hope, physical suffering, and from those conversations emerged, I think, quite naturally, the idea of theodicy or the problem of evil in the face of dementia. And as we begin to look at the problem of evil within dementia, I can honestly say that I was surprised by the data. Three out of four of my participants viewed this disease as no more evil than any other disease. It presented no problem to their theological underpinnings or to their understanding of God in general. The fourth participant had a similar view to that of the others, but amended his view to include a vision of relationship as existing vertically. That is, as existing in that single moment of time rather than horizontally, that is, the moments connected to each other. Some of the data I received in this area is as follows. One participant noted that. It's awful. It's a terrible disease, but no more evil than any other disease. Now we are in the information and knowledge age, and the disease that is coming up into a tsunami is a disease of the brain. What's evil about that? Another participant noted that. Well, there's certainly some very negative sides I don't know if I'd go as far to call it evil in as much as any diseases are evil. And yet another, I don't find it challenges my faith, as I don't believe in a God that protects us from that stuff. So is this disease evil? 
Well, the data is pointing us overwhelmingly in the direction of no. Now, in some ways, this fits quite well with one of the study's overarching theological lenses, that of process theology. The world in this framework is in a constant state of creation and becoming, and God joins in relationship with us in that process, not as a controlling force, but rather as an inviting force, not controlling all the events in the world, but inviting us to move towards the good. This, I think, encapsulates suffering. God does not deny suffering, but rather within suffering invites us towards whatever good can be found within the moment. The challenge to this view when it comes to dementia is that we have a disease that threatens relationship itself. Process theology understands God as being in creation, in relationship with us. But what about a disease that threatens the very fabric of our relationships to one another and to God? In looking over the results of this study, I think we have our answer, and in particular, that language of dementia that we talked about earlier. The results of this study challenge us to reframe our understandings of relationship and how we come to be in relationship with those that have dementia. Does this disease deny relationship? Well, on one level, the level of cognition, maybe. But as we have seen, it is possible to enter into a a different form of relationship. This research challenges us to shift our understanding of dementia from a relationship-denying disease to a relationship-redefining disease. Is dementia evil in that it threatens relationship with one another, with community, and with God? Well, no. It just forces us to reimagine what we consider relationship to be and then how we enter into it. Now, in terms of implications from my research, there have been many, and we've touched on them as we've traveled throughout this presentation together. However, just to recap some of the larger points, the basic need for human relationships still exists, even with those that have become deeply entrenched in dementia. In order to meet this need, we as caregivers need to learn the language of dementia, which is subjective to the individual, and found in the rhythms of dementia itself. The community, as the body of Christ, enters into those rhythms as a support to both the individual and the family to yet again foster relationship. Dementia, inasmuch as it threatens relationship, is not evil, as our engagement with process theology has shown us, but rather it forces us to reconsider what relationship is, Dementia does not deny relationship, it redefines it. Relationship is then subjective. It is vertical in that we enter into it moment to moment without expecting those moments to be connected. It becomes less about cognitive attachment than it does about metaphoric and emotional attachment, and it is trifold in nature, with God at its very center. At this point, I'd just like to say thank you to the members of the class and Jody Clark. Uh, each project that we've gone through has really been a collaboration of sorts, so I, I thank my, my colleagues and Jody. I'd like to thank my participants. Uh, without them, I, I couldn't have done this research. I'm very quite grateful uh, for their assistance and to the very attentive audience in front of me. Thank you. Questions? Hi, Scott. That was awesome. Hey. Uh, you've put me in mind. Uh, what you were talking about uh, dementia as a tsunami in a technological age. Mm. Uh, do you think there's something about the way that we're configuring what a human being is, that it's sort of here in the front of the brain that has to do with the rise of dementia? You know, I, I think perhaps, and one of my participants uh, actually went into great detail around that, uh, and in particular, uh, around our, our need and our desire for cognition, right? And, and really our dependence on cognition. So throughout my interview, she, she continued to push the metaphoric and the rhythmic uh, and, and trying to relate to people in those ways, right? Because we're not just cognitive beings, we relate in different ways and we can join in relationship in different ways. It just seems like within our modern Western society, there's a real dependence on that, that cognition and the way we process information. Yeah, thank you.
Um, Scott, I, I really want to do a heartfelt thank you. You've touched me very deeply with oh, thanks, Shirley. this. Um, as someone who has, you know, experienced the redefining of relationships, I would also add the word enabling the redefining of relationships. Um, I think it's a very beautiful thing when you can do that. And, I, you know, I think it, those who have been in a deep relationship with somebody who has dementia, um, there's two different ways you can kind of go with that. And one is to become frustrated and angry, and the other is to accept and love and to know that the person, you haven't lost your mother, your father, your spouse. Yeah. They're still there. But you are now redefining that relationship. And I, you know, to me, that is so powerful. That person is still there. Yeah. What, still right now. And you, you got me on the word frustrated. And what I'm hoping people take from this, surely, uh, is that when they walk into a room and they see someone with dementia, and maybe that person's rubbing the table over and over and over again. And, and I'm hoping that after this presentation, people won't see a symptom of a disease, uh, but rather a different language of sorts. And maybe instead of seeing it as a symptom, we go in, we sit down, and we take hold of that hand. Uh, maybe we see it as a way, the only way that that person can communicate now. Uh, so exactly right, and I'm hoping that's what people take with them. I, and, and the other thing that came out, I, I mean, I mentioned that this was an hour and a half presentation at one point. So the other, the other thing that I wasn't quite able to include in this uh, was that um, we also have a responsibility as caregivers to the family members to help them learn that language of dementia as well. And that's something that you're articulating now as well. Hi, Helen. Hi, Scott. Um, I'm still, I guess, struggling I want, I'd like to understand how you premised or you went in premising that, or with the expectation that their, your participants might ref, make reflections around, well, you referred to your participants' expectations around the, uh, the, an aspect of evil as a uh, figuring into dementia. Uh, so that's the first one. Where did that expectation come from? And the second is, I'm not sure that, you know, maybe I missed something in theodicy class, but uh, how does evil necessarily become tangent with the Odyssey? I mean, to, uh, maybe I understand the Odyssey as the absence of God, not, you know, this, this uh, because evil is more energetic, deliberate. It has connotations that obviously Unitarians can never understand. But So can you respond to those two things? Why did you premise that you expected your participants to talk about evil. Yeah, uh, I'm going to ask you to repeat the second part when we get to it. Uh, the first part, uh, <laughs> uh, the first part, I had no expectation of running into this. Uh, originally, I, I had no questions designed around eliciting that from my participants. We we entered into uh, in my first uh, interview, we entered into a discussion of, of suffering, uh, and that discussion naturally led into the problem of evil and whether or not. Uh, in the absence of relationship, uh, and I mean, if we're looking at process theology, the absence of relationship would mean, you know, the absence of God, because God enters into relationship with us. Uh, so that, that, that sort of flowed from that, um, that just the discussion and that, that talk of evil. I was surprised, because I, I didn't think, I mean, in my own theology, I, I wouldn't see the disease as evil either. Um, but it's, the conversation just sort of naturally flowed in that direction. And so after that first interview, I, uh, I, I inserted the question. Uh, and, and I found I didn't need to insert it because it continued to come up. Uh, so, and the second part of the question. Well, the second part, I guess, is just a clarification of your understanding of the Odyssey because mm -hmm. For me, theodicy speaks to the absence of God, mm -hmm. or, or, mm -hmm. you know, why does God. God allow, or so forth, but not sort of an, 
this active agent of evilness, that's really problematic for me. So the, the absence of God, and maybe we've, we've touched on that already, but you know, my, my lens of process theology, God enters into relationship with us. But if that relationship is, is taken away, then there is the absence of God there. Um, so, you know, if we're looking at dementia as a, as a relationship denying disease, absolutely. Uh, then, then we enter into the realm, into the realms of evil, uh, as you've articulated it. Uh, well, great job, Scott. Uh, you talked a lot about the care of those with dementia, and I wonder if it came up at all uh, the care of those offering care, uh, mm. self-care. Did that come up at all? Yeah, it's a good question, Ricky. And again, I go back to the hour and a half pre- uh, presentation I had here. I. <laughs> uh, <laughs> really, that was a theme that I, I had to tear out of this thing just, just be for time restraints. Uh, and what was interesting is, you know, I asked the self-care question to my participants, and none of them identified a problem in self-care. Uh, what they did identify were things that they did uh, in terms of their own personal self-care. They all had th- things developed around creating and maintaining boundaries, emotional boundaries, uh, they all had things designed around letting go at the end of the day, uh, relaxing, of getting away from the work of the office. Um, so what that tells me about self-care is, I mean, these people have been in ministry for a very long time, uh, and they, they've created a rhythm of self-care uh, within their ministry that they find healthy uh, and, and that it works for them. So what that tells me is that we as caregivers need to develop that rhythm ourselves as we go out, uh, and we need to be deliberate about entering into that, um, and, and just allowing ourselves, giving ourselves the permission to enter into those things. Thanks a lot, Scott. I, I, uh, I feel a very personal connection to the whole subject of dementia, and uh, obviously your presentation related to um, my father lived with us for 10 years with dementia before he finally passed away, and he uh, lived at home this entire time. And um, I'll be the first to admit that there were many times, both myself and my mother and my wife, got pretty frustrated and pretty angry. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you really want to push back. So the, the piece of your presentation talking about redefining the relationship that's, uh, is, there, is there some more uh, ideas or information you can share about how you go about redefining the relationship, how, not just building an emotional barrier yep. to lock it out or get a yep. moment's break, but some, some tools to, yep. how do you get a hold of this? My participants, uh, from, their, from their experience, uh, each instance of dementia care is gonna be subjective to that individual. Uh, so it, it's really hard to say, do this one thing and it's going to be fine uh, because it's, it's dependent on, on the person and, and who they were in their life uh, and who they are now, right? Um, so, I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, one of my participants, uh, he, he experienced an individual uh, crying out uh, just the same word over and over again in the lunchroom. Uh, and after talking with the nursing staff, uh, this participant realized that, that he had a musical background of sorts. Uh, so he took him to his, his room and uh, the participant brought up his guitar and he started playing for the person. He played one song and he didn't get a response from him. He played another song, he didn't get a response from him. But at the, fi- at the very end, you know, uh, this person actually started clapping uh, for my participant. So there was a connection developed there, but if if this participant had gone to the lunchroom and saw that person just crying out the same word over and over again, uh, and saw it as a symptom of a disease and maybe not something deeper, maybe not a, an attempt at communication, then it would have been left at that and that connection wouldn't have, wouldn't have been made. Uh, so it, you know, that's just one example. And uh, unfortunately, Mo, it's, it's, it's subjective to, uh, to the individual uh, that you're providing the care to. So I can't give you one thing and say, just go ahead and do that. <laughs> Lawrence. Um, thank you, Scott, for your, for your presentation. I have uh, a 
couple of, of, of things that I, I trust you can answer briefly. Uh, one is, given the breadth of the material and, and the amount that you were able to bring in, uh, did your subjects reflect on uh, the change that occurs in the approach to care when the, the person with dementia uh, loses the capacity to verbalize? Uh, they did, actually. I, uh, and in particular, one participant went into great deal around that. Um, and this is the participant that, that really put an emphasis on dropping our own need for cognition. Um, her suggestions uh, were that we go into the room uh, without our own need for cognition uh, and then to enter into whatever rhythm they're presenting us with. Uh, so if they're rubbing a table, go next to them, maybe take their hand. Maybe that's a way of communicating with them. Uh, my previous example of uh, the participant with a musical background, uh, well, that's, that's a non-cognitively based intervention that you can use with people if they have, say, a musical background. And, oh, something actually really, really interesting. Um, one of my participants uh, asked me a question. Uh, and the question was, when is the first experience I've ever had with, with music or rhythm? And I thought about it for a little while, and I came back with, well, probably some time in church, probably when I was a little kid. Uh, and the participant said, well, no, I'm going to challenge you on that one, and uh, I'm going to get you to go back even further to your mother's womb and the heartbeat, that rhythmic heartbeat. And, and of course, that's part of music, that rhythm of music. Uh, so I think music is, is a wonderful intervention that we can use that's not cognitively based, that goes through depth of who we are. Do you think that because of our obsession with cognition as defining personhood, uh, that we're actually, because we have these, these diagnoses like Alzheimer's, um, too quick to label someone who is because of advanced years, because of uh, medication, because of other conditions that slowed down, that we are too quick to diagnose them with dementia? I think in, we, we are getting really good at diagnosing dementia, but I think you're right. I think we do diagnose a little too quickly. I think uh, things like depressions, depression in the elderly can be misinterpreted as, uh, as a dementia of some kind. Uh, I think we need to let go of that a little bit. Um, and, and in our roles as caregivers, maybe challenge that a little bit uh, in the institutional setting. Two two hands, uh, really quick, quick question. You're like you're 45 minutes over. Right? Yeah, but no, I know yeah, you had like good, an hour good. And half worth I, I can go for another two, a quick hour question. and a half. Okay, mine is just actually a quick comment, and I, it, <laughs> it's it's in response to this person over here. I think what needs to happen with the caregiver is a redefining of our expectations of relationship, because when you've been in a, a lifelong relationship with a parent with a spouse. Now suddenly you have to redefine that expectation because it's, it's going to be a very different power differential and that relationship becomes different as a response to that. And I think if you can let go of your expectation of the past relationship, you can start to build on the new relationship. Excellent comment. Thank you so much. Janice. Scott, the timing of your, your presentation is impeccable because as I was eating my bran flakes this morning and was scanning through the latest um, edition of The Observer that just arrived in my mailbox yeah. yesterday, yeah. there's a three-page spread mm -hmm. about caregivers and dementia. Mm -hmm. and, and I didn't have time um, to read the article thoroughly this morning, but there were some points that I did pick up on um, about the, the different challenges that, yeah. that um, the caregivers have mm -hmm. in, in their working with um, dementia care people, and I'm, I'm wondering if your participants named anything specific that, that kind sure. of surprised you in that area. Yeah, actually, actually, it's a really good article, uh, and I recommend it to anybody. It lays out the problems really well. I'm actually hoping to submit this research as an answer or an answer. Um, but uh, cha in terms of challenges, what came out in at least three out of four, maybe four out of four, I'd have to go back to my data, uh, but what came out is that the adult children uh, came across as a challenge uh, for the caregiver uh, in that uh, the things that the adult children can hoist 
or project onto the clergy. Uh, and one participant made mention of, uh, gave me an example of, of uh, adult children that live away, that are unable to visit their parent, uh, and maybe they're feeling some guilt associated with that, and then they go hoist that onto the clergy by saying, well, you're not visiting enough, why aren't you visiting more? Uh, so there's a need there for us to be self-reflective, owning what's ours, and, and, and letting go of what's not. Um, also what came through as a challenge is, is teaching that, that language of dementia that, that I was talking about to the adult children. Uh, the loved one, I mean, one of the, one of the side effects of dementia, I guess, is, is uh, the personality can change. Uh, so the person can be completely different than what they were before. Uh, so learning that language of de dementia and teaching that to the adult children as a way of still maintaining a meaningful, hope-filled connection with their loved one, that came across as a challenge. Um, and then uh, in another interview, uh, I made mention about the importance of the community and the community being the body of Christ and, and reaching out and connecting people into a larger sense of community. Uh, but when the community pulls away from the people that have dementia uh, because of fear or, or misunderstanding or, or what have you, um, you know, so a, a need to go in and to, to educate the community around that so they don't pull away uh, so that they are still you know, an important part of, the, of that connection. Scott has taken us through almost an, ama an amazing, almost hour of presentation on our experience of the, or the experience of people who work with those who live with the reality of dementia. Scott, well done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.